Welcome to Real Estate is Taxing, where we talk about all things real estate tax and break down complex concepts into understandable, entertaining tax topics. My name is Natalie Kalati. I'm your host, and I am so excited that you've decided to join me. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode. So every single year, without fail, there is at least one circumstance where I run across a partnership return after the partnership deadline that is there because a client accidentally created a partnership. They didn't realize they made this. And I know what you're thinking. Natalie, how does that happen? How does someone accidentally create an entire partnership? Well, we're going to talk about it. Let's first start with a few key facts about partnerships. So a partnership is filed on Form 1065. It is a completely different tax return from your 1040, from your personal tax filing. And as a whole, it requires a lot more information than reporting the same activities would on your personal return. So if you have a partnership, if you're reporting a 1065, you have to track more things, including a capital account. You have to track basis. You have to keep a balance sheet. And to really do all of that correctly, you pretty much need to have actual books. You need to have correct bookkeeping done in bookkeeping software, not just sort of pulling together your receipts at your end. It's really hard to do that and have everything tie out correctly with all of the information needed on an entity tax return. So when you have a 1065, a partnership tax return, everything gets reported on that return, right? So if you have a rental, The rental goes on the 1065, all of the income and expenses, everything goes on to that partnership tax return. And then once that return is finished, a K-1 is generated for each partner in the partnership. This is kind of like receiving a W-2 from your job. It is each partner's recap. It is their summary of income or loss for the year and any other kind of little details that matter. It'll have a few other pieces of information. But so the partnership is where everything is reported and it calculates and it figures out the end number. And then each partner receives a K-1 that says, hey, here's your share. This is your amount of income or this is your amount of loss. So that K-1 is then entered on the personal tax return on the 1040. And that's where it's accounted for. So partnership itself, you don't pay tax on the partnership. It then creates a form and you report it on your personal return, and that's where any net tax impact happens. So here's where things get a little squirrely. Is a personal tax return, right, your personal 1040 tax return, is due April 15th. A partnership is due March 15th. This makes sense because to finish your personal return, you would need that K-1 from your partnership. So the partnership has to be done first. So what happens pretty frequently is if someone doesn't know, or like if you don't realize that you had created a partnership and it's now April, tax preparer is going to do your personal taxes that aren't due for a few more weeks. And when going through your documents, what they find is the setup of this LLC and it turns out to be a partnership. Well, shoot, this is problematic because now we have a partnership. And we learned it takes a lot more information. There's a lot more you have to do for it. We don't have any of that because we weren't expecting it. And it's late. So what can we do? So there are a few things we can do when we run into this situation. Because I am telling you guys, it happens far more often than you think. Before we get into the solutions, let's walk through some of the more common ways that this comes up. Like, how does this happen? How do people create an accidental partnership? At a starting point, An LLC that has two or more members creates a partnership. So if you create an LLC with just your name, it's disregarded. To the IRS, it doesn't exist. Federally, it does nothing. Doesn't change your taxes at all. Doesn't change where you file at all. It just creates this legal separation. The rental or the business, whatever it was, gets reported the exact same way as it would if you did not have the LLC. Once you add a second person, It's a partnership, and we have that whole separate return on Form 1065. So one of the most common ways we have an accidental second person 
is with a married couple. It is incredibly common for a married couple to just think, like they're so used to doing everything together, so they set up the LLC and they just put both of their names on it. Like that seems like a totally reasonable thing to do, and it's not wrong, but most of the time we've created a partnership. So that I would say is one of the most common ways I see an accidental partnership come up when it wasn't the intention, right? There wasn't a goal of creating a partnership. They didn't know they were going to have another tax return. It was just a did not realize that was the outcome of putting both of their names on the paperwork. So here is solution number one, if you've got an accidental partnership. So if this is the circumstance that applies to you or applies to your client, right? We have a taxpayer and spouse accidentally put both their names on the LLC. What do we do? Solution number one, in a community property state, if there's an LLC where the only members are the taxpayer and spouse, they can instead choose to be treated as disregarded. Because of those unique state laws in community property states where everything is sort of shared, the way this is handled is that in a community property state only, a taxpayer and spouse who are both members on an LLC can instead choose to have it treated as disregarded. So they can be viewed as one unit. So it's treated the same way as if there was only one owner of that LLC and you would file it exactly the same way. What allows you to do this is RevProc 2002-69. And what happens here is that instead of having to file that separate partnership tax return, if we have an LLC, only two members are the taxpayer and the spouse, and they're in a community property state, we can use this rev proc and file it as though it was a single member LLC instead. So that's your first solution. But this really only helps for community property states, right? So let's talk about some of the other ways this happens, that this comes up accidentally and other solutions and what we can do about it. The next most common accidental partnership I see is the accidental partnership that can happen without an LLC. So two people who are just carrying on a trader business together, you're just running a business, like a shared business together, an active business, that creates a partnership. So if you and a friend are renovating properties together, you're flipping houses together, you're buying it in both your names, fixing it up, selling it, splitting the profit, doing it over and over, that can create a partnership and that would require a 1065 tax return. So even though there wasn't an LLC, even though there wasn't a multi-member LLC, two people carrying on an active trader business together can create a partnership and require a partnership filing. But again, I have good news and I have some potential solutions for you. First option, first solution, there's an exception to this specifically for rental properties. It is stated in the code that the mere co-ownership of a property for the reason of it being held for lease or for rent does not create a partnership unless there are also services provided. So if you and a friend buy a property together that you're going to just rent out and then each year you're going to each report your half on your personal tax returns, that's totally okay. On a rental property, we've got this exclusion. You and someone else, so two people, can own a property together that's held for rent and not create a partnership. If you and someone else buy a property together to renovate, flip, sell, and you're doing that over and over again, we might have a partnership. So active trader business, partnership. If all you're doing is co-owning a rental together, we don't have a partnership. So that's the first piece of good news, right? That's the first solution is if it's a rental, we don't have to worry about this same problem. The next option is if we are operating an active trader business, right? Again, if two people are operating an active trader business together, it normally creates a partnership unless it is a taxpayer and spouse who are operating this business together and there are no other members of the business, right? It is only the taxpayer and spouse. So in this circumstance, we have a, another option here. We have something else we can do for a solution. So if it's only a taxpayer and spouse who are operating an active business together, 
they have the option of instead filing a qualified joint venture. So instead of having to file on Form 1065, instead of having to report like a partnership, they can report a qualified joint venture, which qualifies for any unincorporated business. And what happens in that case is that each spouse reports their own Schedule C. So like if they're flipping houses, they each report their own Schedule C, their own business on the return, and they each report half of everything. Both spouses do have to be participating in the business, and it does have to be split up between the two forms that way. On the one personal return, they file a 1040 together, but we have two different businesses. They each have pretty much half of the business, and they each get credit paid in towards Social Security for that self-employment income. So that's your second solution, right? First solution is if what is being operated together is a rental, we don't have a partnership. Second one is if the people operating an active business together are taxpayer and spouse, we have the option of instead reporting as a qualified joint venture. Okay, so now what you guys are thinking is, well, Natalie, none of those things apply to me, right? What if I just created an LLC with my spouse or with a friend? We're not in a community property state. We bought some rental. Like, what is the solution here? Like, what do I do? I didn't realize we did this. How do we fix it? Do we have to file this 1065? What are my options? Now we're going to go into a series of questions to see how to best fix this, to see what your options are. First question, so you and someone else created a two-person LLC. You put both of your names on the LLC. You're now learning this is a partnership. What happened? Did that partnership actually own the rentals or did you, right? So the first kind of get out of jail free card would be if you and someone else created this LLC together which would normally require a partnership tax return. You set it up because you're going to, you know, purchase rentals and run rentals together, but you never put the rentals in the LLC, right? If that LLC doesn't actually own those properties, you do not have to file that partnership. Like that partnership is not an actual partnership if it is not owning the assets, it is not functioning, it is not actually doing something. So your first option here for something to look at to see if you really have to file this partnership tax return is that if you set up that multi-member LLC to operate these rentals in, were the rentals actually ever put in the LLC? A partnership shouldn't report assets and report the rental income and report rentals it doesn't own. So if those were never moved into there, you've got an option to look at there, talk about it with a tax professional, or if you're a tax professional, look over this and discuss it with your client. If that partnership doesn't actually own the rentals, we might be good, right? You guys own these rentals. You co-own a rental. And like we learned earlier, more than one person co-owning a property for the sake of rental or leasing it does not by default make a partnership. So you might be good. That could be totally fine because you didn't actually take the second step of putting the properties, titling them into the LLC. Second question, did the partnership have any income or deductions or credits during the year. So if you dive in to the code section on this and to CFR 1.603, I think it is, it specifically states that a partnership that does not have any income or deductions or credits for the year does not have a requirement to file. This comes up pretty often as well. If you set up this LLC with yourself and your spouse or yourself and a friend, you're going to buy rentals together, you set it up in November, nothing has happened. You haven't bought a property yet. You maybe bought a property, but it's not in service as a rental yet. All of those costs before you're in service just get added to the basis of the property typically. So there are a lot of circumstances where if you've created a partnership, but if it didn't actually have any income or expenses or reportable things for that year, you might not have a filing requirement. So that is kind of your second thing to check. First one, does this partnership actually own the properties? Second one, does it actually have income or expenses? Because if it doesn't, you might not need to file. If none of those come into play, we do actually have to file a partnership. But now it's late. We found out about it after the fact. Now what do we do? Well, if your partnership has less than 10 people, 10 or less partners, and you meet a few other criteria, 
there is a rev proc that allows us to not incur that late file penalty. So this is late file relief under rev proc 84-35. And if your partnership is going to be filed after that deadline, if you meet these criteria, you can cite this rev proc. You can reference back to this to have the penalties removed. Your partnership has to have 10 or fewer partners. Each partner has to either be an individual or the estate of a deceased partner. Each partner's items of income, deductions, and credits have to be allocated in the same proportion as all other items of income, deductions, and credits, so we can't have a bunch of special allocation. And the partnership has to have not elected to be subject to the consolidated audit procedures under IRC 6221 and 6233. So this relates to the centralized partnership audit regime, which most partnerships should probably elect out of. We'll talk about that in a sec. So as long as you're not opted in, you've elected out of the centralized partnership audit regime. And this last one is key. Each partner reported his or her share of partnership income on his or her timely filed income tax return. So what this means is if you're a tax professional or if you're a client of your tax professional is looking through your stuff, it's April 10th, and that's when they find this partnership, your 1040 isn't due till April 15th. It's not late yet, but your partnership is. As long as this late partnership met these other criteria, and you reported the correct income and expenses on each partner's 1040 that was filed by that April 15th deadline, or you had extensions in place, you meet these criteria. So if a surprise partnership, an accidental partnership, is discovered late, which happens all the time, there's a good chance you can use Rev Proc 84-35 to remove that late filing if you meet these criteria. The last item that I will touch on is that CPAR, Centralized Partnership Audit Regime. Again, most things in tax based on your specific circumstance, so check with your tax professional. Or if you're a tax professional, you should know that this is gonna be different for everyone. But what this allowed a partnership to make changes and pay tax on those changes at the partnership level if there was an error or change discovered, because otherwise, right, like if a partnership had 500 partners, something is wrong and needs to be changed in the partnership, every one of those 500 partners gets a new K-1. That means they also have to all change their personal tax returns and amend their personal returns also. So that's where this came into play. And when that happens, the change happens at the partnership level. The partnership pays the tax. There can be some downside to this because if it was at the partnership level based on the highest rate that they could put there, well, there might be partners whose tax rate personally would have been much lower. So effectively, they're paying more tax than they would have. But so, and as, a, as a starting point, most small partnerships, if you qualify to elect out of this treatment, there's a good chance that that's what you'll want to do. Because if you did not elect out of this, you can't use that late file relief. If you did not elect out of this, you can't amend your return. So if you find something wrong in a prior year partnership tax return, it can't just be amended the same as always. There's an entirely different form. There's an entirely different procedure for submitting for this change, and then it happens at the partnership level. So talk to your professional, see if that's what's best for you, but ask about this if you have a partnership tax return. Ask your tax professional if they elected out of this centralized partnership audit regime. So you are allowed to elect out as long as a few criteria are met. The partnership has to have less than 100 partners, and they have to all be eligible partners. An eligible partner includes an individual, a C-corp, or a foreign entity that would be a C-corp if it was domestic, an S-corporation, or the estates of deceased partners. If those are the only types of partners in the partnership, and there's 100 or less, you have the option to elect out of that whole treatment and keep it so that you can still amend tax returns if you want, the partnership tax returns, and then if there's 
an issue or something found, you would amend the partnership return and all the partners would amend their personal returns and pay their own difference in tax personally at each person's separate tax rate. Ineligible partners. So if the partnership has any partners that are from this list, you can't opt out. You are subject to that centralized partnership audit regime no matter what if you have any of these type of partners. So ineligible partners are going to include other partnerships, trusts, foreign entities that would not be treated as a C-corp if they were domestic, disregarded entities, and estates of individuals other than deceased partners. So why do I mention this as well? Because there are a lot of legal firms that like to set up elaborate partnership structures that include many of these ineligible partner types. So it is really common to have a partnership where one of the partners is another partnership. We have a tiered partnership or a disregarded entity. You have an LLC under a partnership or a trust under a partnership. This is very common. So I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying if your attorney suggests that or if this is part of your structure is a partnership with a partner that is a partnership, a trust or a disregarded entity, Make sure you also understand the tax implications and the filing implications of not being able to elect out of that centralized partnership audit regime. So in conclusion, accidental partnerships happen pretty often. They're pretty common and there are several solutions for how you can fix them and that might work for you. So to go through and recap these solutions real quick, the first option is that if in a community property state and the only members of that multi-member LLC are the taxpayer and spouse, they have the option under Rev Proc 2002-69 to be treated as disregarded instead. The next solution is that if a partnership was created because two or more people are carrying on an active trader business together, your solutions here are that if it was only to own a piece of property for rent, you do not have a partnership, or if the only people operating that trader business are a taxpayer and spouse, then they have the option to instead file as a qualified joint venture where they each just report a business on the 1040. They don't have to file a partnership return. Your last solutions are if you do have to file, you do have a late 1065, you found out about it after the fact, look into Rev Proc. 84-35 to see if you qualify for late relief for submitting that 1065 late and kind of the bonus item because you can't qualify for Rev Proc 8435 if you can't elect out of this is take a look at that CPAR that centralized partnership audit regime and see if you have elected out of it or not or if you can based on what type of partners you have so in short Partnerships aren't a bad thing. There's lots of reasons to intentionally create them. It just happens accidentally pretty often. If you have a partnership tax return, it is due by March 15th, and you can still file a six-month extension. A partnership tax return does require quite a bit of more information, so you will probably need additional bookkeeping, and you're going to have to pay for a second tax return as well, a separate 1065 tax return. So think about this as well when setting up your structure or when talking to attorneys about your legal structure and how it's going to help you on the protection side because this can add up pretty quickly unintentionally. So I'll leave off today's episode with a quick story of something I saw this week on Facebook. So someone posted in a group, a real estate investor group, and they said, I just got the bill for having my taxes done and it's going to be $12,000. This is crazy. Like we have six rental properties. We have six LLCs. Like this is madness. There's nothing too complicated about it. People are all over the place, right? Like that's ridiculous. You're getting ripped off. That's crazy. I can't believe that much. But we ask a few more questions. Guess what? They had set up every LLC and every single LLC held one rental Every single LLC was an LLC owned by both the taxpayer and the spouse. So every single rental had its own partnership return. 
if you want to file your own partnership return on TurboTax, I think they charge like $1,200 for you to do it yourself. So if you're going to go to a tax firm with six partnerships, paying 12 grand, which is, you know, two grand a return plus their personal, that's not out of the realm of a reasonable price. It's that these taxpayers didn't realize they had accidentally created a half dozen partnerships. Additionally, since they didn't know that's what happened, I'm guessing they also didn't have really good books and tracking to do a partnership either, so that tax firm probably had to put a fair amount of time into some bookkeeping to kind of pull together that information. So that's kind of my warning story, is accidental partnerships happen, try to prevent it. If you have two or more people on an LLC, it is almost always going to create a partnership. Or if you are just operating an active business with another person, it is likely going to create a partnership. I hope some of these solutions are helpful for you. So as always, I am so thankful to you guys for listening. Please make sure if you found some value in this episode, or if you're sitting there and thinking of the person you accidentally created a partnership with, please share this episode with them. Share it, like it, give us a follow. And if you are a tax professional, please join us in the online Facebook group. If you're a real estate investor, I've got a separate group for real estate investors. Links to everything are in the show notes. Thanks so much for listening, and I will talk to you guys next week.